I have over I have over 10 years of industry experience, majority of them in product management, and I'm really happy to see so many people joining the call across the world. And and and, and I, I I hope you will be able to uh, gain some of, uh, gain some knowledge or, or like probably learn something from my experiences and and and, and things which I've done in the past. Uh, what I will do is I will just kind of uh, like what to expect from this session is basically. Uh, so what 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 I will do today is based on my experience and the products which are built and how I went about building this product, I will try to share my learnings of what has worked for me, what has not worked for me, how I went about building those things. So as, as, as you can see on the screen, I have basically worked across four organizations in the last 10 years, uh, like in startups, in big companies, in relatively uh, mid-sized companies. And few of the products that I've worked on are, are a Microsoft Edge, Microsoft Teams, and Microsoft Azure. And I, what I will try to do is I will try to kind of uh, bring some learnings of how I went about building uh, product strategy for some of these product initiatives, which I've worked as part of these companies, and also try to kind of uh, bring some industry uh, examples as well, so that we just don't make it a very framework of bookish session. We try to kind of mix it up with with uh, with some learnings and 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 some and some examples, so that so that people will be able to not just take the reference, but also actually see how these examples were used in real life. Uh, majority of my career has been in the B two B space. But whatever I'm going to talk about will also be applicable equally in the B2C space as well. So without further ado, what I, I will we'll start a session. So before we talk about uh, in terms of how to build a great product strategy, I think it, it is good for us to understand that why do we need a product strategy in the first place? Like, like what's the importance and why it is so important for organizations in today's world, especially when it comes to a digital first or tech first companies, why do we need to have a product strategy in the first place? So first thing is like product strategy is a means for your organizations to achieve their business goals or company goals. To give an example, right? Uh, Amazon, uh, we, all, we all know is a, is a, is, is, is a very big e-commerce giant. Uh, they entered India market probably around sometime in 2012 or 13. I don't remember the exact dates, but but when they entered the India market, uh, they had to make a lot of customization in the product. Like like India has has very different nuances compared to the Western economies. Like in India, email address were not very prevalent. It was basically phone number based country. Uh, language was a barrier, so English was not uh, known to a lot of people. So they had to do a lot of localization. But the, the most important thing that Amazon had to do was credit card penetration and debit card penetration in India was very low. So they actually went with this something called pay on delivery or cash on delivery, which they started a while back. So they made a lot of this customization. They made a lot of these changes to the product that then, that helped them kind of compete and win in the India market. So, so, the, so if you see the business was about expanding into India market and then product team basically decided, hey, they understand the market, they understand the problems, and they try to customize the product so that it can serve the it can serve and meet the business goals. Basically, that, that, that's the first thing. Like helping achieve business goals, company goals is the, is, is the foremost objective of product strategy. The second one is in today's world, there are so many competitors, so many players in the market. How do you differentiate yourself? How do you win against competitor? Right. So your product strategy basically helps you differentiate with your competitors. And it also helps you kind of, you know, leave for competitors, maybe kind of create a niche for yourself so that you can compete very effectively in the market. To give an example, right? Uh, if you see Slack and Teams, both of them are very collaboration software. Like both of them allow you to chat, collaborate, or do get work done. But the but the target segment they are serving or the kind of functionality which they serve are very different. The Slack is more optimized for a chat-based communication platform, whereas uh, Teams is more of, I would say, a suite of product which has uh, video calling, chatting, document editing, and so on and so forth, right? So, so from that point, you can see that the market and the problem they're trying to solve is very different, even though they kind of play in the same same, uh, same industry or same, I would say, product suite per se. Last but not the least, product strategy helps you drive alignment with relevant stakeholder. Uh, if you really see that uh, customers, uh, there are multiple touch points with which customer interact with your brand. With interact with your company. For example, they might use your app, but they also might reach out to your support team or email. They might kind of go to your 
uh, website to kind of get more information. So it's very important for you to kind of make sure that not just the product that you're building uh, is kind of great, but at the same time, you need to make sure that every department or every function in the company is aligned with what you're trying to do. Uh, if it is not, then it will going to be a broken experience and you, your product will not be successful. For example, let's say if you're trying to build an AI product, you really need to make sure that your customer support is technically equipped. You really need to make sure you really you really make to need to make sure that your documentation, your evangelism team is is capable enough of, of of solving customer queries, right? So so product strategy is also a means or a tools or a way to kind of uh, help drive alignment with all the stakeholders in the company. So now that we have discussed what why do we need a product strategy. Uh, let's look at uh, some of the high level things. We're not going to detail right now. We'll go in detail in the slide in, in the further uh, sections. Uh, let's try to see that what things that a product strategy means to answer. The first and the foremost is the, what's the long-term vision and the value proposition of a product. Uh, you can consider long-term vision to be like a North star of what, where you want to take the product or where you want to take your company in the next two to three years. Now, this is not about uh, the features. This is not about um, uh, what, what next deliverable do you want to create? But it's actually about uh, what's the long-term vision you have for company. To give an example, when I was working for Microsoft and when I was working for Microsoft Teams, our vision was to build the best collaborative tool in the world that will help schools, individuals, and organizations to achieve more, uh, more on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was, a, that was a vision that we had. And then that vision was basically, was becoming a guiding principle for us to kind of take product decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, second thing that product strategy means to serve is, is, is what are the product goals for the medium to short term? Uh, again, the, 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 the timeline for these goals can vary depending upon the size of the company and can vary the product maturity that you have. For example, in a large company like Microsoft, we used to have 12 months goal. Like, like for the, in the next 12 months, we want to take the product here. But when I'm working in mail mode, it's a relatively startup, much, much smaller setup. We are, we are putting a quarterly goal that, hey, for the next three months, we want to achieve this. For the next three months, we want to achieve this. You can imagine goals to be like checkpoints, which you have that will help you move towards a long-term vision you have. If I have to give a, a non-product analogy, imagine, for example, if you're trying to climb a mountain, or let's say if people are trying to climb a very big mountain, you will probably have this various checkpoints, right? You will have base camp set up in multiple places where you where you will reach, you will rest, and then you take, take the next leap, right? So you can imagine product goals to be like those checkpoints which you have that, hey, I'm focusing on achieving my next checkpoint, which will take me closer towards the path of my lot, not stop vision that we have. Last but not the least is uh, product strategy helps you identify the features, the deliverable, the task or the activities which you will do on a, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis that will help you towards achieving your business goals, which in turn will help you achieve your long-term vision. So I, I know it's, 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 it's very jargonish. So let's, let's try to take it with an example. So I'm not sure how many of you saw a recent uh, announcement or, or, or recent conference, which was done by Airbnb, uh, where they put the vision that, hey, we want Airbnb to be for everyone. That's the vision they want to go ahead. Because as of now, uh, Airbnb, people use it, but it's not for everyone. People uh, take it as an alternative, but it's not yet, I would say, ubiquitous in the world right now. So, so the vision they are setting up for, for the next ten to for, for, for the next five to ten years is that Airbnb is for everyone. So, in order for them to achieve towards that vision, they're setting up uh, like they're setting up basically three goals or three strategic pillars for 2022. It's like uh, you can live anywhere with on Airbnb, unlock the next generation of host, and Airbnb become the ultimate host. So these are like, I would say, goals that we have set up for the company and, and the product goals are also aligned or can or are basically aligned is towards these three, uh, three strategic pillars that we're talking about. And when it comes to st uh, specific investment or, or the features that they're looking to build, uh, you can see things like they are kind of introducing Airbnb plus, they're using things like super host, super guest, they're building new categorization in the platform, they're building new collections. So as you can see, 
uh, they are basically trying to like with the investment they are making on the ground they are trying to achieve the short term goals of making uh, airbnb more accessible and available for the communities or make it easy for them to access make it easy for them to decide uh, which which airbnb host they want to stay in but which in turn will help them with the long term vision that we have um so i, I think I, i hope things are clear and uh, please keep question coming in the chat window we'll solve it uh, we will we'll try to answer towards the end now now that we discussed that hey why do we need product strategy and what at a high level product strategy tends to answer now let let's let's look at things of how one should go about building the product strategy so first thing we need to understand is what are the things that that influences a product strategy now as we discussed earlier that product strategy serves certain purpose it is meant to help achieve business outcome or uh, win against competitor or help drive alignment so what i will do is i will try to kind of talk about three things here in terms of uh, what are the things that kind of uh, you know uh, what are the things that uh, uh that that uh, influence the product strategy on a day to day basis so for example your product strategy will be determined based on which market which customer which geography you are trying to serve for example let's say uh let's say microsoft for like um, uh, for, let's imagine for example grab for example right grab is a taxi service which is operating primarily in the southeast asia region whereas uh uber is more of a global brand they they are basically operating in multiple countries so the product strategy for both of these country uh, both of these companies will be very different uh if i if i look at from the b2b market you can see that you can you can take a look at salesforce or dynamic crm uh, these are basically crm software which is targeted more towards very very large enterprises but if you compare to that if you look at uh, smb based crm software like freshdesk or hubspot they all they, they, their primary focus is more smb and mid market companies so the way they will build a product or the kind of things they will build in the product will be very different the next thing that you have to consider in your product strategy is what is the distribution channel you have to you you are you're basically choosing to sell your product for example and and that distribution channel is also dependent upon uh, the market you are trying to serve for example if you're trying to Uh, target large enterprises you will need to have a dedicated direct sales employee which are engaging and doing face to face demo and meeting customers multiple time but let's say on the other hand if you're trying to uh, serve a very small businessman with 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 couple of people or couple of employees in the organization you will probably be doing completely uh, no touch onboarding where people will come to the website buy the software enter the credit card details and boom they will they will they will be up and running on the go right uh, again your business model also determines a product strategy for example if i'm selling a product which is free of cost then i will be looking at my product strategy will need to look at things in which how can i drive more engagement how can i drive people to kind of you know see ads or whatever monetization uh, way i'm making monetization i will focus on those kind of things but let's say if you are like if, or, or or the other way if you're trying to sell a saas software where you are getting a monthly subscription fee your product strategy will be more about hey how do i reduce churn how do i upsell customers to a higher version of the product now uh, so so you see there are various inputs that are coming into product but at the same time so it actually goes both way uh, for example let's say uh, if you are building a new product you kind you build a product and then you see what is the uh, what is the distribution channel what's the market what's the business model you need to serve in but sometimes when you are when you are in a established company like microsoft if you are trying to build a new product then it's a, it goes the other way around you sometimes have to build product or build features or build scenarios which serves the existing distribution channel that you have which serves the existing business model you have or which serves the existing market or the customer that you're serving so it actually goes uh, both way depending upon what kind of company you're working in at a startup product basically determines the other things but in a large established firm where you already have a very established product in the market sometimes the, it's the other way around based on the market business model and the distribution channel you use you sometimes decide your product strategy accordingly now let's let's look at how do you go about building product strategy so i typically kind of look at things in 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 two ways and what i will do is i will try to kind of talk about how uh, so i joined mail mode only two months back uh, and uh, and i actually went through the process of creating the product strategy that we are executing on right now so what i will do is i will try to kind of you know 
uh, walk you through of what I have done when I was building the strategy for Mail Modo, and what are the like like what are the things I did, and how I went about those things. And in the end, I will try to show a snippet, or actual snippet of of our product strategy document. I will not put everything because it's, it's, it's obviously it's confidential. But I will try to bring the snippet and and the structure that will basically can become a framework for all of you guys or all of you folks to kind of you know. Uh, Uh, use this as a as a building block when you are building product strategy for your organization or for your company uh, so the phase one is all about understanding and analyzing the product landscape uh, i broken down into four sub parts or four activities the first one is you understand the current situation of the product and the way i went about was i talked to my founders i talked to my product team i tried to get insight from the business team in terms of who they are selling how they are selling what they are hearing from the customer what are the challenges that you having in the product when you are building what are the like what are the things that you that you feel we should be doing you know that that basically is, is to kind of you know help you assimilate more and more information because when you are trying to uh, join a new company when you are trying to work in a new space you have to like it's it's all it's very important for you to assimilate as much as information so that you you need to understand the breadth of the space or the breadth of the industry you are operating so the first thing i did was i actually went about talking to all the people i can within the company to get their brain dump as much uh, as quickly as possible so that's, that's the first thing i did the second thing i did was i started like based on the uh, first thing which i did i talked to the uh, team members i started understanding key problems i i had some problem already identified based on the things that people said what i did i tried i went about identifying more problems and i also started validating the hypothesis which i was creating in the meantime for example people said uh, like when i was talking to my team members and and like in the case of mail mode mail mode is a email marketing company and typically people who are new to email marketing they often find it difficult to kind of understand how to do email marketing in the first place like there are a lot of these nuances that comes into the picture which we sometimes people don't know and that was a problem which was consistently called out by everyone so i went actually when i was doing the customer research or when i actually talked to some experts from the industry it i kind of kept analyzing or kept validating the hypothesis and at the same time i also started analyzing the product usage data like whatever telemetry or whatever instrumentation that we were doing i kind of started corroborating whatever hypothesis that i created to kind of see what are the issues we are seeing in the in the product so to so, so the first to step basically help me identify the problems in the uh, in the product and also help me understand that hey what are the what are the things that we should be doing but we are not doing in the product the third thing i did was uh, again because we were in a very uh, because email marketing like email marketing is is a, is a growing space but it also a space where there are a lot of competitors so we it, it was important for me to understand what our competitors are doing and how we can differentiate differentiate from a competitor because it's a crowded market so you really have to stand out uh, um, you really have to stand out for the market right so in order to understand the uh, understand the market opportunities and, and and find the compete gaps i basically did three things i tried to look at industry reports like gartner reports idc reports and stuff like that to see uh, what they have to say about the competitors and what they have to say about email marketing as a or marketing automation as an industry and where they are going so that 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 basically help us identify some growth opportunities or or other trends of where the market is going next i actually looked at competitor website to see uh, how they are positioning their product what are the value proposition that they are talking about what are the key problems that they are solving for and all and what are the problems that customers are facing who are using competitors like for example especially in the saas world you have a lot of these uh, review tools like g2 crowd captera and a lot of other tools where you can actually see feedback from actual customers who are using this product so so you know kind of it's very important for me to it was very important for me to understand uh, what are the market opportunities what are the compete gaps we were identifying so that kind of helped me understand what's the industry trend and stuff like that the last but the actually very important as i was talking earlier next i started looking into the company goals for example we are at a certain mrr and we wanted to grow to a certain mrr in the by the end of the year so we actually looked at those things we actually looked at what are the type of customers we are going after what are the expansion uh, rate we are focusing on what are the geographies of course yeah? so i used those uh, company goals as a way to to use that as, as a framework to define my product objectives and also to kind of you know help me the decide on the product direction that i want to take going forward so 
Now imagine when when I completed the first step, right? I basically can imagine I was in a more of a jigsaw puzzle state where I had bits and pieces of a lot of things which are which are in my head, and now I have to start making sense of all of this and start connecting the dots so that I can have a coherent. Strategy which encompasses the, all the things that we talked about earlier. So, so the first step was all about assimilating the information and and creating this this, this bits and pieces in your head. And the next step was is all about putting this thing together. So, how you go about putting this together, right? Like like what are the like the first thing was more about I would say exploratory, what more research. The second phase of the product strategy is all about summarizing it, all about structuring it, and all about presenting it to the people so that they can understand. Now. I typically prefer creating product strategy in the form of a document, but you can actually create product strategy in whatever format you want. You can actually use a OneNote. You can actually use uh, uh, like like Miro. You can use any tool you want. But the idea is, uh, product strategy needs to answer these four or five things very very clearly. The first thing that you need to have in a product strategy document, or when I write my product strategy document, is I put together uh, the summary of the research which I've done in the phase one. Uh, now, now, what are what are the things I need to do? I don't need to have a long story of 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 you know. I don't need to write a novel of what all we have done. It's very pointed insights or 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 things of what we are, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, or what are the things uh, we are good at, and what are the things we are not good at. Uh, this the 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 summary or the research should not be more than a one page at max and whatever data that you want to corroborate has to be in the appendix and then it because people will not going to read it people will not going to understand if you kind of keep keep writing a lot of long things the the second thing that you have to once you have summarized the research and you have analyzed the thing you start putting together the long term vision of the product the first thing that i talked about in the in, in the what part of the product strategy so the things you put here is you put your one line vision statement you put your value proposition of what the product benefits are or key features or key outcome that people will be able to drive with your product you also have to specify the target customer you want to target again uh, as and the thing is uh, one thing with target customer is that when the product is just getting launched or when you're building the first version of the product uh, the target customer will be very very focused but as you keep growing the product and you keep entering into more and more market and more and more industry your target customer will keep on increasing for example uh, when 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 let's say when when uh, when uh, uh, for example let's say when slack started in the industry they were focusing more on startup they were focusing more on small businesses but now they are targeting enterprise as well so so you know target customer will be keep on changing as you keep expanding a product and and strategy also keeps changing for that matter so so with each strategy you will design what are the customer segment you want to focus on and typically the primary customer segment uh, after you decide the target customer you also have to define the persona that you want to target for example in the case of mail modo our target persona our primary target persona is marketeer even though our platform can be used by developers and product managers but the core the persona that we have or, or right now we are optimizing a product for is the market your persona and, and the last thing that you have to specify in your vision is what are the key use case or what are the key scenario you want to serve for and these key use cases are basically the things which you will differentiate your product for for example zoom does meeting and zoom probably does meeting the best uh, like they 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 do video conferencing probably the best out in the market right now so they have very much specifically identified video conferencing as a use case and they want to optimize the product for that like maybe other platform also do video conferencing but bunch of other features but zoom has decided that video conferencing is a key feature that we'll focus on uh, next thing is once you have decided a long term vision as i mentioned earlier you have to start identifying the okrs the product goals and these product goals will be in line with the business goals that we had jot down in phase 1 uh, your product goals cannot be uh, if a product goals are not aligned with your business goal then it's a recipe, it's it's a recipe for disaster because even though you build a product you do something it eventually your goals and your business objective will not be met so the things you have to do here is you have to basically Put together your business of uh, product objectives or product goals or OKRs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, apart from that, you also identify uh, the the investment areas uh, or, or 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 the or the things you will be investing at a high level. And in the next slide, I will try to cover what are those high level investment that we are focusing on, how we look at a product investment. Uh, so the idea is that this high level investment themes and this OKR will basically help you 
um, prioritize uh, which feature or uh, which which area to invest in and how much to invest in those area to give an example right let's say when you're building a product uh, like, like when you're building a product right it might happen that you will spend 40% of bandwidth to build new features but you will spend 30% of the features to uh, kind of you know improve your engineering systems or you let's say you have grown very fast in the last 2 years and your your your, your engineering team was very much focused on uh, on on just building features and as a result of which you have accumulated a lot of technical debt so you know this framework or this prioritization really helps you uh, uh, you know uh, allocating your resources in the appropriate manner so that you don't over uh, you don't over index on one particular thing which will hamper the overall business and overall product in a big way last but not the least uh, once you identify the investment themes and okrs you start creating the product backlog or the or the individual features or the or the or the, or the deliverables you will be uh, building or, or or features you will be building in each of this investment work stream and assigning owner for that for example there can be a work stream for example let's say you're trying to build a new marketplace uh, let, let's say you are trying to build a new marketplace for your for a product now marketplace will require uh, someone to kind of reach out to the uh, customers and and get their apps available in your marketplace so that will be an initiative which you will call out and and that initiative will be part of your product strategy and there will be owner assigned to it so that they work on that it's actually tied to the first part where it's about driving alignment with stakeholders and making sure that everybody knows what they have to do in order for us to succeed now i know until now things have been very jargonish so what i will do i will try to cover a real life example and i will try to pick snippet of what our product strategy is all about uh, so here is a vision right so if you see our mail mode of vision is to build the most advanced platform for marketer developer business users to create and send personalized interactive emails at scale so so you know as you can see i am highlighting create and send personalized interactive emails at scale because that's the differentiating factor for us that's the unique value proposition that's the key differentiator that we are creating for our product that that we want to kind of do better than the competitor that we probably have to be the best in that thing uh, which we which which other platforms are not doing and we want to kind of uh, do better so that that becomes a value prop that we differentiate ourselves in the market now to give an example a target audience right now for example can be that hey marketers in smb and mid size company Uh, again and then the value proposition that you want to give it to them is use the platform to send promotional campaign and converse with the customer via rich content and interactive experience throughout the life cycle again for developers we'll have a different value proposition for a for a product managers we'll have a different value but for a marketer in a smb and a mid size company where they anyway don't have a lot of resources to kind of do this marketing we want to focus more on the low code and the ease of use of a platform to differentiate now in terms of the use cases we want to focus on data collection we want to focus on transaction commerce and you want to make it uh, content consumption within emails very very rich so these are the key use cases there are other use cases as well but most of our investment will be falling into these three buckets where we want to make sure that these three are the hero use cases that we want to optimize our product for now if you look at a detailed more value proposition uh, i will not go through the details but the idea is that uh, for each of these uh, key problems that people face like 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 more like uh, for each of the problem the marketer face uh, these are the value proposition that we are talking about like for email creation for user management for marketing automation integration we have a certain value proposition that basically is nothing but the product benefits that we intend to serve or that we intend to provide to the customers on a ongoing basis so the first thing is more or less mostly the product vision i didn't cover the summary because it was not relevant for this talk what i want to cover next is i want to cover the product goals investment framework and roadmap so a product okrs is twofold one is increase the number of paid customer signing up on our platform let's say if 100 people are signing up on a platform we want to make sure that more and more people purchase or more and more people upgrade to a purchase plan so you know that that's the first okr for example we have right now there are multiple of them but i just i just picked two of them for this conversation the second one is we need to reduce the number of support tickets raised by the customer because right now we are still new we are still small company so as we as the customers are growing we really cannot uh, keep hiring more people at the same rate so what we are doing we are kind of making sure that product becomes simple and intuitive to use so that the uh, so that number of support ticket can be raised on average basis so those are the two key okrs and uh, and and whatever product investment we going to make will kind of tie to these okrs and will come up with these right now as i talked about like we have defined the okrs 
Now, the next thing we have to define is the investment framework we're going to make, or it's the, what's the prioritization framework we're going to make. So we have basically broken down our, our product investment into four buckets. Uh, the first bucket is uh, we will focus on the features or the investment which are required from the business priority perspective. Now, business priority is nothing but things which are blocking our customers, things which customers are calling out as an issue, things which our customers are complaining or things which sales team need to kind of make sales happen with the customer. So that, that's what we are calling, uh, putting all of them under, under business priority as an umbrella. The second one is product fundamentals. Like, like you need to make sure that your product is sleek, product is snappy, product is loaded fast, page load fast, everything happens very seamlessly. So we have product fundamentals as a bucket. Third one is compete gaps. Like because we are an email marketing platform and there's certain, uh, and as I said, we are in a more of a crowded space. So there are certain things that people always expect from our email marketing platform. And we keep need to make sure that we keep closing on the gap in that area so that our product become more competitive in the market and we can target more and more scenarios. Last but not the least, um, we also, so, so the first thing is basically about more of the, I would say bread and butter, which will help us kind of keep having a stable growth or steady growth in our company. But let's say if you really want to kind of keep growing at an accelerated pace, like for example, if you leave, if you want to grow at 100% every six months, every quarter, we need to keep investing in new product extension. We need to keep investing in new scenarios. So for that, we kind of call those things as big bets. Now, those are the things that we keep on investing so that sales team can actually go and upsell our existing customer for a higher upgrade plan. Or, we, or basically, we can actually start uh, getting more money for the product because we are providing more functionality and more scenarios to be a platform. Now, the idea of this uh, prioritization framework is for you to help decide how much of the bandwidth you want to allocate in each resources. To give an example, we, we have right now, we decide internally that we will not be investing in more than one big bet every quarter. So, so that, you know, we kind of restrict ourselves to how much big bet we spend. And for example, we can say that, hey, 20% of our engineering time will always go on product fundamentals because that is, that is very critical. That is like table stake. We have to keep improving. Otherwise, if we don't do a good job at that, people will gonna churn. So there's no point for us selling more and more to a customer if people are not gonna stick. So we kind of have a balance of how much we wanna invest in each of those bucket. And that's what basically this prioritization framework or this investment area help us identify. Next, how does the product roadmap will look like? So as I mentioned earlier, so again, this is just a sample. The actual roadmap does not look like this at all, but I'm just for the sake of simplicity. What I did basically, I just identified the areas and I just mentioned that, hey, from let's say from April to June, these are the things we want to invest in. From June to October, these are the things we want to invest in. And I, in reality, it's like you need to kind of add more details here. But for this purpose, this can be a sample roadmap where you just keep a simple tab of what are the areas of features you want to invest in and what are the investment you want to do in, in each of those bucket in the next three to six months and so on and so forth. Uh, so that that's that's a very a uh, quick snapshot, I would say very quick snap, a snippet of what our, uh, of what our product strategy document might look like. And the, the, the key aspect is that uh, the product strategy document is not to be built in silos. You basically pick a lot of input from multiple people and then try to kind of, you know, uh, make sure that everybody is aligned and everybody input is being considered and make sure that it actually is the, is the, is the, is the right thing that you're trying to build to serve the business goals or to serve the company's objective. Uh, that, that, that's pretty much what I had to say uh, from the deck perspective. I think we can open the floor for q and I'm, I'm not sure if people have any question, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm mostly done with the content which I had to present and I can share the deck offline and I will pause and see if people have questions to discuss. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. I look, uh, I'm, I, we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to let my um, team member, Mariam, to take over the Q&A section in hosting you on that. Mariam? Sure. Thanks, Felix. Uh, thanks, Alok, for this amazing session. I think we do have a couple of questions. We can take that. Um, yeah. We have uh, the first question from Anupam Ayer, who has asked that how to set goals for non-profit SaaS. How to set goal for? Uh, non-profit SaaS. Non-profit SaaS. Yeah. So, so I think, I think, I think, uh, especially in non-profit SaaS. Again, at least again, um, I will try to uh, kind of give it with an anecdote of how we were considering um, when, when when I was building a product. So when I was in the Azure team. 
um, I was building a platform which was about, um, uh, it, it was basically a learning management software, which was specifically built for the nonprofits and the government sector. So like government organization, nonprofit. And the way we kind of were considering, so again, even though it, we, Microsoft was not a, was not a, I would say a non, non-profit organization, but, but because our, most of our customers were nonprofit, uh, it's very important for us to uh, kind of, um, uh, like, I think, I think, I, again, uh, just one clarification, uh, is the, is the SaaS company is not a non-profit company. The, the SaaS company is a profit company, but you're kind of trying to serve a customer who are non-profit. It, it, that's the question, right, Mazumi, right, Mariam? Yeah, so the company is non-profit. That's what she, uh, she meant. The SaaS, okay. So, so yeah. in that perspective, okay. Uh, so even though in the, in, this, in, the case of, in the case of a non-profit SaaS, uh, the goal may, will not be to make profit. But there will be always be some goals, right? The goals can be to kind of maybe to reach out, like it may it may be the impact that you're creating in the community. It might be around how many people are getting benefited from your product. It may be about what kind of uh, like how you're helping uh, the people who you are serving, how they are getting updated. For example, in the case of ADP, for example, I know ADP also has a .org domain, but it can be, for example, for us, ADP can be that hey, how many people are able to enter product management? world, like how many of people can get actually product management job by doing the mentoring session from this platform. So, you know, there are always some proxy metric that you can use, which may not be about chasing revenue because in a for-profit revenue is the ultimate goal that typically people try to serve on. But there are also, there are a lot of these, uh, and typically always uh, money is always a leading indicator in, in the company, right? Like, uh, like for example, if I, if we have to achieve a uh, hundred K, MRR, for example, let's say we launch a product and you have to hit hit 100k MRR. You like you will you will you can't track MRR. You will need to track how many demos we are doing, how many leads we are generating. So you kind of need to figure out other data which kind of directly associated with the impact of the growth that you're making in the company. And that's the kind of typically where, where we were looking at things when I was building that product, even though we were not a nonprofit. Our customers were nonprofit. That's how they were looking at things. Like they were not talking about revenue. They were looking at other metrics like life impacted usage and those kind of things because ultimately they wanted to just break even. And they were getting like they had a limited budget. They were getting money. They were serving the uh, people. So the, the uh, re- revenue growth was not the thing. It was more about impact and the and the things that you do in the uh, like for, for the people. All right. Thank you, Alok. I think. Uh... It has answered the question of Anupam. We can move to the next question. I think we have a lot of questions here. So Simran has asked, where does product strategy lie in a design process? When should you execute it as a designer? Um, okay, so I think I think, um, I think think typically what I've observed is that um, um, design process or, or, or the design involvement, at least for my past experience, has started getting involved in the understanding landscape itself. Because when you're talking to these customers, when you're talking to customers, identifying problem, when you talk to the stakeholders, get customer feedback, there itself you kind of understand that, hey, uh, we need to kind of, you know, um, we need to, like, like our design is not great. Our product is not usable. So during the, I would say during the problem solving phase itself, you try to kind of get a feel that, hey, design is a problem like we need to fix it like you know now if design if if that is a i would say a theme or a problem which is emerging out then during the second phase of solutioning phase you typically kind of try to kind of uh, take input from the design team to at least come up with a high level things of what you want to achieve from the design perspective you may not have pixel perfect ui you may not have the workflow rated but you will probably start setting up a principle that hey we want to make sure that our product is intuitive you want to make sure that people are able to understand the product and and use the product in a in a in a, in a completely no touch point so you start putting those goals or those uh, like you know those high level goals uh, which is a combination of i would say which will which a designer and pm will come together so the product strategy which i mentioned is even though pm is driving it the contribution is coming from uh, coming not just from pm but all the other stakeholders so doing the analyzing space itself the design come into the picture, they provide the input. And as and when you assimilate the information, PM does keep taking input from the design team to make sure that, hey, let's let's talk about what we are thinking about. Then that kind of a thing will be the value. For example, let's say um, doing the solution phase, uh, let, let's, let, let's consider Microsoft, for example, right? Microsoft has this suite of product. 
Now, I'm not sure how many people have used Office or Word or PowerPoint, but you will see there's a consistency between all the platform. So design bring those elements that, hey, one of the investment area or the OKR that we have is that consistency across all the product suite that you're building, not just this application, but across suite. And that's where I would say the design come both in the problem phase as well as solution phase. So at least based on my experience, uh, to cut things short, doing the problem space itself, at least I have interacted with design. Design inputs have always been coming in the problem solving phase itself for me. Right, then, uh, so we have next question. How do you able to forecast the success of the product strategy? Because stakeholder may reject it if there is no valid forecast, right? Exactly, exactly. Which is why, as I mentioned, the product strategy goals cannot be different from the business goals. So we need to make sure that business, you cannot, you cannot deviate. You cannot deviate or you cannot have goals which does not align with the business goal. So for example, right? If you are, if your company is an enterprise company, if you're selling only to enterprise, you cannot have a product goals which says, I want to optimize the product for SMB, or you will not even optimize your product for SMB because let's say if my onboarding is not streamlined, it's okay. Because I will be having an army of people sitting with the customer to help them on a process on a day-to-day basis. So if your product strategy goals are not aligned with the business goals, you anyway will not be able to, which is why you need to first understand the business goals, you need to understand the KPIs that we as a overall company, we as a business are try, trying to strive. And again, depending upon what size of the company you're working, for example, in a Microsoft, typically product goals are, uh, are not very much aligned to business goals. Product goals are more aligned to organization goals. For example, I was working, I was heading one particular vertical for Teams, com- teams product, right? So I was making sure that whatever goals that my leadership team has set up at a team's product goals level, I need to make sure that my goals are aligned with those goals. Again, I can provide my inputs, but ultimately once that goals are defined, you have to make sure that your goals are aligned with Otherwise you will not get the traction. You will not get the right buy-in from the stakeholder, which is why uh, product strategy, it's more about alignment, stakeholder and business alignment than actually what you have to build. And you can't build those silos. So if you're like, if you're not doing it, then you can't. Like, there's no, there's no second thought about it. You have to have to talk to business for alignment. Absolutely right. So, uh, the, uh, Vincent has asked as well that what do you think is the biggest mistake the junior product manager or startup company usually make? Uh, yeah. So I'm still new to the startup world, so I can actually I'm still learning. But some of the things I've done, uh, I, I, I would observe. I, I, I'm actually making sure that my team do not go through the same thing. In a startup world, uh, because we are running so fast, like there are so many things happening and there are always more work than, pe- than, than the amount of people that we have. We do a lot of work, but sometimes we don't take a step back and, and you know, kind of uh, take a step back and kind of think about, hey, what, did, what are the things I did? Like, because what happens, like, like uh, again, I'm, I'm the VP of product. I have a, I have a, small, I have a, I have a team of six, six people in the team and I have a lot of work. So what happens, often times, I will just tell them what to do and they will do those things. But it's very important for us to sometimes take a step back and think about why a certain decision was taken. Actually, maybe uh, like a junior PM should always make sure that in your one-on-ones, you should not be just talking about work. You have to talk about other things as well because I am more experienced. I know why I'm taking certain decisions. I need to educate to my junior PMs as well that, hey, this is a framework or these are the priorities or these are the things that we need to do. And so that they also understand that whatever decision that we are taking as a company or on a day-to-day basis, how does that align with the overall goal? So that's, I would say, is the biggest mistake a junior PM can make where they are not asking these questions or they are not reaching out to the managers or reaching out to their employ- uh, like seniors for guidance, for feedback of what, why we are doing this. I keep asking questions because if you don't do that, because in startup, you don't have the luxury to like, you know, kind of uh, think a lot. You can't kind of ponder our problems over weeks and weeks and then give a solution. In a big company, you can. You have the luxury where you can spend a month investigating and then a month writing spec and then you the product will get implemented. But in startup, it's like you decide on day one, you research on day two, day three, you write the spec and day four, it's implemented. So, which is why you need to kind of make sure you always take a step back and keep summarizing and keep thinking about those things. Otherwise, you will learn a lot, but you will not be able to build that structured thinking that you typically need as a PM. Right. 
So uh, the next question is from Simran that do you think a product strategist and a designer are different roles or can they be overlapped? Um, to be honest, I, I'm really not sure about this different uh, nomenclature means. Uh, for me, I would say PM is a very, very generalist job, I would say. Uh, I, I, can, I can talk about PM, uh, like I can talk about the people. I, first of all, I'm not, uh, I, I've really not worked with the product strategist. I, I, I really don't know what the role is. But I can uh, like I will tell you what, how designer and PM role kind of you know uh, can overlap and can mix and match. Now a product manager is supposed to do whatever it takes to make the product successful. In my career, if I have a designer who is not only designing the product but is able to think of scenarios, I will let him think about it because as a product manager, I can work on other things because because my job is not to solve the problem. My job is to just make sure that the right problem is getting solved and the person who is solving it is he the right person or not so for example if my designer if my design is capable of thinking of scenarios listing all the details okay when like these are the, like for example let's say i'm i'm i'm, I'm building a new sign up flow on my platform or let's say i'm building new different login plat login method in the platform if my designer is able to chalk out okay uh, like when if the login is failed this is what you have to do. If the login is passed, this is what you have to do. If my designer is able to think about it, I will more than happy to give that person that responsibility and just not build a UI, think of the scenario as well. So I would say design is more, I would say, is a very uh, uh, specific role. I would say it's more of a expertise role where uh, you are focusing on interaction, you're focusing on visual design, you're focusing on user research. Uh, you will be the expert on those area. PM will be a generalist where he will not, like for example, PM may not know how to build a great UI, but PM can have a, I, okay, this is a good UI, this is not bad, this is a bad UI. So that's the, I would say difference where uh, the, on a skill basis, if you rate designer on a scale of one to 10, you, ten, you rate designer 10, PM will be somewhere at four to five on an average across the board. Some PMs will be more, but on an average, that's the difference. Similarly, some designers can become a PM as well. They, they can actually think like a PM. They can think of a uh, product features. They can give up ideas. They can, so that kind of keep working. So from that perspective, there's an overlap between PM and design. They can be overlap. And now it's up to the PM to decide how they want to leverage the designer the best. And it's for designer to see what, where all they want to contribute. Like in my life, if my designer is working on the PM side as well, I'm more than happy to give him that task because I can work on other things from that matter. Thank you. Uh, so next question is from Abhay. He is asking that the product roles should be ideally qualitative or quantitative. Sorry, come again. Uh, can you so repeat the question? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So Abhay has asked that the product goals should be ideally qualitative or quantitative. Uh, it should be it should be quantitative always. Uh, if you're not able to come up with a quantitative number, you need to figure out a proxy for that. For example, let's say in engineering world, you keep doing this re-architecture of code, right? You keep doing like, and it's really hard to quantify that, hey, we are doing this re-architecture of the product, but the re-architecture has to have some goals that, hey, this will reduce my build time by 30%. This will increase my developer productivity by X percent. So no matter what, you need to need to have a very quantitative goal. And there's always be a way where you can determine the impact of that uh, thing. As simple as that, there are sometimes that in the past, we have worked on AI features. We have worked on some features just to make sure that the employee morale is high. The, 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 the goal that we put was, okay, we are building this feature. We are doing this feature so that the team is happy. And how do we measure team is happy? That whenever we do a monthly feedback of how you are doing and how is life in general, we should get a, like, most, like we, should, we should get more positive score. So every single time the goal has to be, has to be quantitative. Otherwise it's not a goal. Please remove it from the table. Uh, next is from Dian. He's asking, how do you keep all of the changes into one lean frictionless uh, customer journey? Uh, okay, it's, it's hard. It's not easy, first of all, it's hard. Uh, so what you try to do is you, like, again, the way I have done is, uh, you try to kind of break down things. You can't fix. You can't fix everything in one go. So, like typically, what you try to do, you try to break down the whole journey. Let's let let's say the, like, like for example, in in our case, email, in the case of mail modo, uh, whenever a person signs up the platform, the customer journey does not end. Customer journey ends when people send their first campaign. 
So there are at least three to four steps that happens in between those journey. So what we try to do is, again, let's imagine that's the whole journey. You try to break down into smaller pieces and take these like as, a, as like I would say milestone or checkpoint. And you try to see where the biggest drop off is or where the most friction is happening in your platform. And you try to fix one by one. You try to fix one by one. You try to fix one by one. Because if you try to look at the whole journey at one go, you will neither be able to create a, uh, create a very streamlined journey. You will neither be able to solve anything which if, if anything is going wrong. So you have to break the problem into smaller chunks and then see how these smaller chunks are behaving individually. And then you will be able to have a better picture of how the overall small, small chunk connect together and create a bigger picture for you. Okay, so Danny has asked, how do you balance between user needs and business needs when planning your roadmap or creating a product strategy? Yeah, uh, actually, so I would say, uh, I would say, typically, I would say user need, you have to have a fine balance sometimes. Like, again, there's two things here. Uh, for example, if user is asking for a feature, which is not going to be used across the board, you know, like, let's say if, if there's a custom feature, you have to have a fine balance. Uh, for example, let's say you want to ultimately grow. The, ultimately, the objective is you want to grow your revenue by X, let's say, right? Now, to grow this revenue, there are two things. You will probably need to onboard more customers and that customer will ask for some feature and that basically will be user need for that matter, okay? And there can be some feature that you have to build to optimize your selling process. To give an example, let's say, right? Uh, typically, you see this lot of these product when you sign up on the platform, they ask you a lot of these bunch of these questions. Hey, which industry you are from? Where did you hear from us? How, how, how do you want to use a platform? That information is not to use to kind of, sometimes it is used to help the sales team classify the lead. Like so that based on the information they enter, the sales team can decide whether to reach out to this customer or not. So you try to kind of balance, you have to have a balance. It's not white, like again, for that matter, PM role itself is not black and white, it's a, it's a shade of gray. So in this case, you have, to have a, you have to have a fine balance. For example, there are some case where we do need to kind of prioritize some investment, which are primarily coming from the, business teams uh, again when i say business needs i want to make one thing clear that it is sales or marketing is asking for a certain feature it's not the because ultimately if customers asking for feature it's again a user need for me so you try to have a fine balance majority of the time i try to incline toward user needs but there are certain cases where if the sales team is really getting hurt or marketing really needs something to make their product successful or may or to help them grow their like help them achieve their goals you try to prioritize those as well so that's the way. So again, if always given a chance, user needs always trumps the internal needs as long as it can be manageable. It, if it cannot be manageable, then sorry, it, we need to prioritize and we need to kind of decide, uh, create a balance, and which is why that how much investment you have to make in different buckets, you decide you help, it helps you from that perspective. Like, okay, if I will not spend more than 20% in there, like that's it. It cannot go beyond that because I, I need to serve these people as well. So you kind of create that kind of balance is typically how, how I would say we have to do it. Got it, okay. So June has asked, uh, what is your process to introduce change, a review for the product strategy? What is your decision criteria to inject a change or reject a change? Okay, uh, it's, 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 it's a very, very, it's actually, to be honest, is one of the hardest thing a PM has to do. Hardest thing, like, you know, like people all, like, again, I, I worked in Microsoft, so again, in Microsoft, if I'm working in Microsoft, it's not the hardest thing I have to do is convince people to align because I it's not important that I will be able to think of the great product ideas, great business model, everything. The idea is to drive alignment. So it so the way you kind of typically do is you kind of uh, and the way I have done is you try to kind of start. Don't try to kind of you know try to bring everyone at one go. You try to kind of talk to them individually first. For example, let's say if I had a certain way of thinking and I want to kind of, I'm, I have a certain point of view, I will first talk to my manager. I, uh, let's say in Microsoft, I first talk to my manager and share my thoughts with her or him, get their inputs. Then I will try to, and I know which all people need to be aligned to this way of thinking. So I will try to kind of, you know, get some sense or get some idea from them beforehand, before I try to break it up in a broader forum. At least in Microsoft, that's how I've been operating, where you try to get uh, informal feedback or informal discussion of how you, 
what do you think about this so that you have an informal thing already going on and so that you already have warmed up the person to your line of thought yeah and you already know the concern so you can actually kind of be already know what are the things that they're going to talk about and that's how you kind of then start opening up in a broader forum so the idea is you two things one is you get them warm up you understand their kpis for example i was building a product at microsoft where for the first one year we did not see any traction because the product that we are building it was not aligned with how sales were selling the product because in microsoft you have 1000 product to sell you sales team will not be selling your one single product so you need to understand what's the biggest problem that stakeholder has what they need what their goals are and you have to see how your product can help you solve their goals or meet their goals that's the model that i can it's, it's a long process it takes time depending upon how complex and how big all you are working and how much a bigger change you are asking it will take time and i think sometimes it does take 6 months 9 months to even get things off the ground so okay so uh, shard has asked in your experience how can designers bring more value to the table when having this conversation with project uh, sorry product managers during the pro uh, product strategy phase um sure so i think i think one thing which i've learned and i think one thing which i've often seen um especially with, with the design uh, sometimes is that uh, design team if the design team is already plugged into the business or they understand the business priorities they are able to think from business like again sometimes we like for some time we well, like design team focus on user experience user needs experience how 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 good the interaction is but if you can if if you design team can also have the same uh, in, like same mentality of hey what's the business we are trying to achieve the, the, the because the problem is or the, or the challenge here is that pm is the only person that is most closest to the business everybody else is primarily hearing from the pm so i think when the pm when the designer is having a conversation the conversation should not be just about the product or the experience you are building the, the the conversation should be about the business aspect as well because that will do two things that will make sure that you are able to force pms to focus on the right problem because sometimes pms we as a pm get very happy when we build a feature but even if sometimes we focus a lot more on output than outcome like output is the bunch of activity hey i ship this feature great but did it result in the business impact answer is no so if the more designer can ask questions to the pm that hey what problem we are trying to solve why we are if you are not clear i think that's the biggest value addition that a designer can do during this phase where you keep asking the questions keep asking that hey what is the problem what are we trying to solve what's the business scenario what is the use case because that will make sure that everybody is diligently thinking about those things because often what happens is pm is the one who will probably sometimes doing heavy lifting on this one but pm if pm does own all the heavy lifting then the output will not be great because i think it's 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 given that the more diverse thoughts come together the better the outcome is so the more designer can contribute in those space i think the better they will be able to add value and they will be convinced that hey why we need to do this and they will be also having less iteration because when design team come with with, with us some feedback and they say okay this is great but it doesn't solve this problem because because design may not have asked that question to pm earlier and pm also made a mistake ki okay i'm not communicated with it, this is important so the more questions you ask the better it is basically all right on that note i think we're done with all the questions so thank you so much alok for uh, answering all the questions and it was an amazing session uh, any last thought you want to share uh, with everyone um yeah so i think only my honor to pass i'm i'm very thankful for this session it was really great to see so many people attending and actually people are attending from across the world like so i and especially for people who are in subcontinent region uh, i'm really really thankful that you're taking it in the friday evening so mm -hmm. so first of all thanks and i would say uh, i just want to say that hey product strategy sometimes it's more about making sure that everybody's heard so when like i think pm should not be thinking of product strategy as a way that they they have to do all the work sometimes it's it's mostly about making sure that you're basically capturing every people's thought and putting it in a document and making sure that you are driving alignment for example when i joined i it has been two months 
I built the product strategy. I didn't do all the job. Majority of the work was more about trying to pick my founder's brain, like like my Akib who is my CEO and Apur who is my CTO. I'm just picking their brains of what they want to do with the company, of how they want to take the company forward. And my job was to understand those things and understand the challenges, the context, and then probably put to something which a lot of people already must have already known about it. At least I know my founders. Eighty percent thing I mentioned in the document, they must they must already be knowing about it. Just that what I've done is I've tried to put together in a way that is structured, that is understandable, that fits the people mental model, and help you understand that have we covered all the bases? Because idea is product is not just in isolation; it's actually a combination of everything. So your job is not to kind of be the one who is doing all the thinking. Your sometimes it's more about getting everybody on the same page, making sure all the bases are covered. and then making sure that all those people are doing their job and align with the thinking because if people are not aligned that's the thing that folks this is what you're trying to do are you aligned or not if you're aligned then you can't say that hey i'm not aligned because that's the job you have done anyway so at least in a big company this is the valuation that the pm at the most in a smaller company pm does have to do a lot of heavy lifting of thinking through as well but in a big company and especially at what level you're working it kind of sometimes it's more about just making sure that you are picking everybody's mind and just thinking about and having a point of view that that makes sense across the board thank you alok uh, for sharing uh, this uh, last thought i think it was really helpful for everyone uh, it was for me as well uh, i learned a lot today so thank you so much for this session thank you so much thanks a lot likewise thank it you. was great attending everyone bye 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 everyone thank you so much for joining